Welcome to Pottery Visited, episode 22. I'm Tori. And I'm Shay. Today we are covering chapter 4 of Chamber of Secrets at Flourish and Blots. Or, as we like to call it, the less sexy red herring. Well, starting off, we have Harry just, you know, living life at the burrow, and he's completely in shock because everything is amazing at the burrow, and everyone likes him, and it's so weird from his normal life where he cowers in fear and is abused by the Dursleys. Yeah, it's nice for him to be in an atmosphere that's loving and warm. (laughs) Yeah, one thing he notes is that uh, he's getting used to life at the burrow, so there's, like, the stark difference is that the, the burrow is kind of crazy, Whereas the Dursleys are very clinical and their house is like basically like a showroom. And also that uh, he's getting used to like living with all the Weasleys. So apparently there are explosions from Fred and George's room at this point and they're normal. So I was wondering if they were already kind of starting to develop. Weasleys, wizard, wheezes. I think it's interesting because we know they can't be doing spell work in there. So they must just be doing potions, like potions that don't involve any taps of the wand or anything. So they're just in there doing advanced potioning on their spare time. Like, no wonder they're so smart, even though they don't test well. They're like some smart guys, those twins. Yeah, like we said in the last uh, episode, that they're really outside the box thinkers. So they're probably just like doing some kind of experiments. Yeah, it's probably really cool. Well, Harry's in shock that everyone likes him, which is sad. Ginny really likes him. Yeah, I'm going into Ginny's early crush on Harry. I find so adorable. It's so cute. Like, she's knocking everything over every time she sees him and she gets all embarrassed and flustered. And it's just like, it's so sweet. (laughs) So innocent. Yeah, I never had a crush on any of my brother's friends growing up because the people he was friends with. But like, I can totally see that as a thing that probably happens to a lot of younger siblings who have older siblings. They end up having like a crush on their older sibling's friend or something. So I can see it as like, it all makes sense to me. And Brown is probably rolling his eyes like, oh, Ginny's got such a crush on him. And yeah, they do. We, we know they tease here about it. Like, but I just feel like it's just like, it just, everything in these, these earlier books just feels so like, it's more sweet reading it as an adult. It's just like thinking of like, little of Neil Jenny with like her first crush on Harry and stuff compared to like all the trauma that we face in the later books. So I like that everything's really cute and innocent. Well, everyone gets their Hogwarts letter, and we notice that every one of Gilderoy Lockhart's books is on the list. And we know later in the chapter that Gilderoy Lockhart's going to be teaching. But it reminds me of um, uni professors who assign all their own books for their course syllabus, which you relate to. I didn't have textbooks in my program, but you had to buy textbooks. Yeah. Oh, gosh. I had a sociology teacher years ago, and he's the only teacher whose name I still remember from when I went to Queens because of how much we made fun of him for the fact that the assigned readings were his book. And he would intentionally republish his book every year, but slightly change the chapter order, basically, so that you had to rebuy, like buy an original new edition and you couldn't sell your edition a year later and someone else couldn't buy it off of you. It was such a scam. It's like the insider trading of being a teacher and it just felt so shady and I hated it. And I hated him for it. Other little things was um, Percy comes in wearing a knitted tank top, which... Yeah, it's awful. (laughs) Yes. I have so many questions. Is it like... Is it knitted like he didn't have enough shirts and Mrs. Weasley knitted him one, like basically just like a low cut sleeveless sweater? Or is it knitted in like a sexy crochet crop top going to a summer festival? I mean, those are coming back. I have one, but I wear it more like in the fall with like, because it's kind of black and witchy and it goes with my like witchy tights and stuff. But I, I that's what I, I, I don't know which Percy's is. If it's just like... Can you imagine Percy in uh, your black knitted crop top that's what he's wearing yeah it's like a it's yeah it's like there's fabric behind the boob bit and then the rest of it is just open crocheting and uh snazzy he's there's tassels on the bottom it's a really <laughs> good look percy's looking his best right now i don't know if it, that was like a trend because we we kind of infer that th- this took place in like the early 90s so i don't know if knitted tops were like a trend back then but i don't know it was just I mean, like, I feel like knitted sweaters were always a thing in the UK because of the weather they have. But, like, a knitted tank top to me seems like... Yeah, it, it clearly says tank top, which is why it kind of threw me off. I was like, why? Like, maybe they meant, like, like an undershirt that you would wear underneath, like, a sweater or a something or else. And it just happens to have been knitted because 
Miss Weasley made it rather than buying it. I don't know. I don't know, but I prefer the, like, cute crochet crop top look for Percy. He, you know, he deserves to have some fun. Fun with fashion. But moving away from Percy, I just, um, Hermione writes Ron because Ron told her of his master plan and his criminal, I don't know, ideas. Plots. Hermione was all about for rescuing Harry, but she's like, don't get him in trouble, as Hermione does. And she knows that she's very busy with schoolwork. So we kind of go back to the idea that they have summer homework. But like, what kind of schoolwork is she working on? Yeah, especially because she does not have her books yet. Yeah, because she asked them to go. They're going to meet in London upcoming. So she's just doing her summer homework. But what is she doing? Summer homework. Ugh. I mean, maybe like... There's like one chapter at the end of every textbook you get each year that you don't cover in class that they're like, okay, go over this in the summer without using magic. Like maybe just like history of magic essays. I could see them assigning essays or something or just like little like, you remember when you had like textbooks and maybe like like questions for the chapter? I wonder if they just get them to do that just to refresh your memory before you go into the new year. Because you always, always have that at the beginning of school are usually pretty difficult where you're trying to like remember what you learned the year before so i don't know but yeah that would make sense to me that would be all right if it was just like a refresher not for marks even ron's like what school work we're on vacation <laughs> i was like yes ron yes you shouldn't be doing school work in the summer I'm like what are you talking about one of the things i love to talk about whenever we're at the weasley's house or not at hogwarts is the blatant use of underage magic that nobody brings up. Like, they're out there playing Quidditch. Harry and the twins and Ron. And I'm like, okay, quick question. Is flying not magic? Like, I don't... Is the broom the thing that is magic? But I, I'm so confused by... I think when they say they can't do magic outside of school because they're underage, I think it refers to like using magic with their wand. But I think it's unfair because, like... Obviously, like, the Weasleys live in a magical household. So I don't, because I think what, I think, I don't know if it's canon or not, but I think it has been described that, like, if they do magic at the Weasleys' house because there's so much magic in the air, that they don't really get caught for it. But for Muggle families, like Hermione or Harry, like, obviously, they're the only, like, wizard or witch there. So obviously, like, the trace would, like, catch it or something. It seems like an unfair advantage, but. But I feel like that's, what, that's how people kind of explain all, like, the magic that happens at the Weasleys and how it's, like, enforced and stuff. But I think, like, brooms and stuff, that's just, like, like toys or just, yeah. like, normal stuff to them. Like, that doesn't really count for them. But, yeah, it is, it is kind of unfair that they get to, like, do stuff like that. Like, Harry talks about being thrown off the Quidditch team because he can't practice on his broom. And he's never done his broom in, like, two months. But it's just, like, how do people that are from, like, Muggle families practice... Quidditch in the summer. Yeah, it, it's pretty unfair. But I mean, I guess it makes sense for like a lot of sports that are like expensive where you can't do it recreationally and you can only do it through school unless you have loads of money. It's kind of like that. Like there's always different inequalities going on. Well, as we talked about, the Wizarding Society is kind of like classes and bullshit. So Kind of. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> They're very elitist. That is for sure. So we kind of get a hint here that Percy is not acting like himself and he's locking himself up in his room and he's not quoting about his owl marks. And then Fred and George are kind of like, kind of concerned. They're like, what is Percy up to? Yeah. I like that Percy is this book's red-headed herring. <laughs> it, like in this book, it's because it, it's such a, like, you're like, Percy. I mean, I guess he, he's the type that would do something obnoxious. and we, we just think he's doing something boring. like. But they give you a lot of reasons to suspect Percy as being... A bad seed, up to some type of mysterious, not fun mysterious business like the twins would be up to, but like something nefarious. And it turns out all he was doing was writing to his girlfriend. <laughs> yeah, what a letdown. I mean, spoiler alert. I mean, this book came out in 1998, so can we really use a spoiler alert? I just think it's funny that he's the red herring. I'm like, sure, yeah, Percy, the boring brother is definitely potentially the bad guy. Checks out. I'm just saying Snape is a sexier red herring. I'm saying it right now. So moving forward, they decide to all go to Diagon Alley. And it turns out the Weasleys use flu, which Harry never, has never used before. And it seems awful. And I don't know why they were thinking like, oh, what could go wrong? Yeah. Nothing. Like, I feel like, I don't know if like side along flu is a thing, like side along apparition. Yeah, that's what I thought too. Like, maybe they couldn't fit two people in, like, the reason it's not done is because most 
two adults can't fit in the fireplace together. But I thought Harry's not an adult; he's twelve. But yeah, but I was thinking like the reason it could work is like Ron and Harry are both like twelve; they could probably fit together. Yeah, there should definitely be an option for that, and like. It just doesn't make sense to send him in all alone, unprepared. Like, they should have maybe at least had him, like, fake do it once, just standing in the living room so they know he gets his pronunciation right or something. I don't know. It's just not the best method of transportation for, for Harry. We need, yeah, we need... Yeah, even the way he describes it, it sounds awful. Like, I am not a person that usually gets motion sick, but just, like, the way they were describing, like keeping his elbows in and he felt like just being sprawled around. Like, I don't really like being dizzy or having blood I hate being upside down because it reminds me of a, a roller coaster and I do like roller coasters but I don't like ones that are spinning around or uh, go upside down because just like I feel like my brain like liquefies I don't know how to describe it I hate that feeling <laughs> I mean, I get it. It's definitely, I feel like it's probably something that people get used to when they're magic and they do it a lot and it no longer affects them. Like when you play virtual reality games for the first time, they call it getting your VR legs, kind of like getting your sea legs where at first you're going to get nauseous a lot and then you get used to it. Yeah, yeah. So I feel like with time, one gets used to flu powder. Well, it's probably like the only thing that the Weasleys can do to get their family to travel because uh, not all of them can operate and it's probably like the easiest like method to travel with kids. Yeah, absolutely. Port keys we've seen seem to be regulated, so... Yeah, and kind of tedious to set up, probably. Weird. It's weird that, like, this really cool, neat magic is just normal, and Ron probably has been doing it since he was born. Like, they probably flew powdered first day old baby Ron from the hospital to their house, you know? Also, then you see if Ron kind of, like, especially getting, like, this environment with where he kind of forgets that Harry or Hermione don't know things... And this is like where Ron's kind of character comes in, where he's the connection between the wizarding world, because Harry's an outsider coming into it. And Hermione knows things from reading books, but there's things you wouldn't know. And we talk about how this is kind of like not included with Ron in the movies, how he's like our like link to wizarding society. And this is just a thing where like it's normal to him because he does it all the time, but it's not normal to us because we're used to Harry and we're used to like muggle transportation. Yeah. So Harry fails at flu powder, and ends up in Nocturne Alley. Of course. The shady part of town. So this reminds me of, you know, like, when you're on school holidays and you run into someone from school that you like, don't want to see? This is what it reminds me of. Like, I have people, like, not even people I didn't like. It's just, like, I don't... There's just people that, like, that were different just school people, like, people you saw at school. You weren't friends. You are just your peers. And you just don't want to see them when you're on your holidays. And it's ten times worse because Harry and Malfoy don't like each other and obviously harry's all like his glasses are broken he's all like covered in soot and he looks terrible he doesn't want malfoy coming in because malfoy would be the one that just like would love that so <laughs> he comes and he hides and it's just like the most relatable thing because i remember like being in, like the, a store or something and seeing someone from school my mom who was friends with like everyone's mom would be like oh there's so-and-so like i don't want to see so-and-so Oh, I know that. Yeah, the friendly mom thing. I have that too. She's like, oh, we should go say hello to. And I'm like, no, no, we shouldn't. I do not want to. Like, I am not friends with that person. <laughs> I don't need to see them during my summer holidays. I will see them at school. I am taking time off from people I don't yeah. like. <laughs> we get Draco and his dad coming into Morgan Burks. And the funniest thing is that Malfoy is just complaining about Harry Potter the entire time. And you just know that this is what he complains about. I love the uh, the joke that like Draco Malfoy is a typical teenage girl. He's, you know, always complaining about school and obsessed with a famous teenage boy. It's uh, But he's just going on to his father. He's like, oh, smart Potter, wonderful Potter with his scar and his broomstick. Yeah, and the funniest thing is that Lucy's just like, I know this. You've told me this about a million times. He's like, oh my god, shut up, Draco. I was like, Draco's just at his manor, just like complaining about Harry Potter. All summer long. And his dad's like, ugh, not this again. I feel kind of bad for Lucy. I know that's a hot take, but I, uh, I think it's interesting that Draco's so personally, not just like he doesn't just dislike Harry Potter, like he hates kind of the role Harry Potter got to have at Hogwarts. He was really clearly resentful of Harry being seen as like popular and likable. And clearly Draco expected it to have been himself, like maybe because of his blood status or his dad's money or how elite they are. He sort of walks around like he thinks he's better than everyone. And I think Draco was shocked to go to Hogwarts and face the reality that like not everyone values the things that he 
he values in himself. There are way more important things than money and blood status. And it's his first time probably realizing that. Yeah, it's also the first time being told no, probably, because he wanted originally to be friends with Harry at the beginning of the series. And Harry told him that he could go shove it. And he's not used to, like, being, like, I guess, like, cast aside. So it's just like, oh, if you're not going to be friends with me. Yeah, he's an only child, too, right? Which is, I think is kind of a part of it. And we, we get the idea that he's, like, very, like, spoiled and, like, obviously Lucy seems hard on him. But we also know that he has, like, an air of importance. Like, it's just, like, the name. I feel like Draco's an example of, like, he's spoiled financially and, like, with gifts and stuff. But he's probably very neglected emotionally. Like, his mom seems to love him. But his dad definitely doesn't provide him the emotional support that he needs. Yeah, it's kind of like any kind of aristocratic family. So he's always trying to get his dad's approval and his dad's just like giving him gifts to shut him up. Well, yeah, we can kind of see that here where Lucius will kind of like put him down and Malfoy's like, well, that's not my fault that I didn't do well in the exam because Hermione did it, did the best. And Lucius like, oh, you should be ashamed of that. And just like, he doesn't really praise Draco. It's always like, we kind of, I think um, Jason Isaacs did a really good job of like showing that like being the reason why Draco is so awful is because this is who his role model is. Yeah, he's an incredible Lucius. And I also adore how dramatic and like kind of glamorous that Jason, Jason Isaacs played Lucius Malfoy. Like the way he carried himself, the like the, the way the costume department gave him the bedazzled wand, like He's, his hair, for goodness sake, is so luscious and glorious. And it's just such a well put together character. Everything really screams like old money. And yeah, like, can we let's just talk about Lucius for a minute. So this is the first time we're meeting Lucius Malfoy. And we've kind of like heard of him a little bit. And we know that like, we've heard beginning and the, the book that like, he was supposedly really close with Voldemort, but he says he's under the Imperius curse and Mr. Weasley does not like him. Yeah. And so this is our first time like meeting him and we get kind of get to see like a different side of it because usually Draco is the one kind of doing all the bullying and stuff, but we see where he gets it from. Absolutely. He just comes across so cold and awful and just the way he carries himself to like Harry just gets like bad vibes from him. Absolutely. Yeah. He's got an aura of like superiority that you kind of want to punch him in the face for, which checks out. I feel like that's maybe what like, it's almost like the Malfoys are royalty. It, I mean, they are based on blood status in their minds. They are. And Lucius Malfoy really carries himself like he was born with silver spoons and yeah, which he probably was. <laughs> exactly. So he he it's you can sort of see the family history in Lucius and you can see it in Draco too. And it's really interesting to see how it carried on between the generations. It's a uh, questionable. They're very questionable. I do feel bad for Draco a bit in the way his father treats him. Like, I think with Draco, a lot of obviously the person he is comes from what his parents instilled in him and what they told him to value. But like, this poor kid clearly just wants his dad to like him and be proud of him. And he's failing at that. <laughs> and that's got to be heartbreaking for an 11 year old. Yeah, especially being like, I think a young boy really looks up to their dad. And so like, he values his dad's opinion. But I think that Lucy's just the kind of dad that's like not going to give you like praise, but he will give you like criticism. So he's not going to be like, oh, well done. But if you do something wrong, he's going to be like, oh, you should have done that better. Like Draco not doing, being the best in the class or Draco not being on the Quidditch team. Yeah. But he still obviously cares because he like buys like the whole Slytherin team brooms and whatnot. I wonder how much of what Malfoy does for Draco is for Draco to make Draco happy and how much it is to make Draco look better and to make the family look better, like the perception of them. Like he doesn't want people to think, oh, he has some kid who's second in his class and doesn't play the Quidditch team. He wants people to think, wow, Draco's smart. Wow, Draco's athletic. Wow, Draco. Like, so that the, the it reflects well on the family rather than actually caring about Draco's well-being. Yeah, no, maybe it's a bit of both. Lucius definitely is someone who like values how he's seen and he plays like the game very well to make sure he's in with the right people. But I do think that he definitely values Draco that Drake because Draco is like his heir, and I feel like as an aristocratic family, like he values having like the male heir, and that's just like yeah, his purpose is to train Draco up to take over like the Malfoy name. I don't know how much he cares for Draco, like, on, like, a personal level. His well-being emotionally. It's kind of weird, because if you actually think about it, Harry and Draco could have been friends. I know Draco was a dick at first, but, like, they both have the same underlying sort of issue, kind of, when it comes to, like, just wanting to feel accepted, not knowing their own worth, and being expected to live up to someone else's expectation of what you should be doing. 
Like, yeah, the difference is Harry had support. I mean, I say support in quotations because the support was like Dumbledore, and we know what Dumbledore oh. does. But he still had more support than um, Draco had from people that actually cared about his well-being. Like, he, Harry has, like, the Weasleys and Hermione and Ron and a lot more, like, other father figures besides Dumbledore. Yeah, and Harry's always looking for a father figure. He's collecting them. He's always available to adopt a new father figure. Collecting some dads. He's open. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Uh, one of the things I love about this chapter is, like, how many objects we get to interact with that become important later. Like, obviously, the vanishing cabinet yes. becomes a huge deal later on. And we also see the neck, the cursed necklace as well. The uh, Half-Blood Prince. I'm assuming it was, because, like, what other necklace would it be? Because we know that Malfoy got it from Broken and Burks. It's interesting how much book six foreshadowing happens in this one chapter of book two. I mean, the, the you mentioned the Hand of Glory. Then we also ask Malfoy sees the Hand of Glory and is interested and then uh, Lucius kind of puts Malfoy down for like being like, oh, my, I guess my son will be a thief because he's failing school. It's just so many. I find it really interesting and I love the idea of Borgen and Burke's just an old wizarding shop full of old antique secondhand dark magical objects. Like that is so much up my alley. Like it's like Stephen King's Needful Things meets magic, dark wizardy magic. It's so interesting. Like I would 100% read a series of short stories about different artifacts from Borgen and Burks, like 20 pages on a necklace that's killed all its owners and like a little bit on the different, how that impacted history and like magic enchanted shoes that make you dance yourself to death and a little bit on how they've, what they have done in their time, you know, who owns them and how they got here. I would love that. I don't know if that's the nerdiest thing ever, but just like, I'm so on board. It is really cool, like, seeing all the different objects. And, like, Harry just gets, like, this, like, really bad feeling being in there. Because it just doesn't have the good vibes that Diagon Alley has. Like, it's obviously a dark place. Yeah. Because Harry's like that. But I would love to mess around with the dark artifacts. It's slithering in you. So we see that Malfoy wants to sell some of his dark stuff, which is a lot of poisons. So I don't know what Malfoy's doing. <laughs> and... He, like, Borgen kind of um, says that there's, like, lots of secrets at Malfoy Manor. So I'm just like, what is happening at Malfoy Manor? What is Lucius doing in his, like, dungeon? I mean, poisoning people, apparently. <laughs> apparently. <laughs> I mean, I guess it's safe to say that he probably has a lot of, like, dark, weird artifacts. Some of them are probably just, like, weird fanboy things. Like, this was a shoe worn by Lord Voldemort. You know what I mean? Because, like, everyone knows he's in with the Death Eaters. So some of it's probably, like, weird shit like that. But I'm sure some of it's, like, really cool, dark, dangerous things. I think it's interesting that, like, everyone knows they're there. And it's also interesting that Borgen acknowledges that Lucius is giving him some cool stuff, but has cooler, scarier stuff he's not selling him. But if he's getting rid of stuff because of Arthur Weasley's raids... Where is he hiding his really, really cool, dangerous stuff if he's not selling it? Does he have like a very small, very secret hole in the floor of his mansion and that he can hide some things? I believe when they question Malfoy, Malfoy says that they have their own kind of like hidden chamber or something. Yeah. Where they hide all the their, their cool stuff. I guess, but it's not big enough for all his stuff. So he has to sell some of his stuff. Well, it's things, yeah, I guess that he couldn't hide or things that he thinks that the ministry would, like, if the, if the ministry did find them, that he'd be in trouble. Because he, he has good standing with the ministry because he puts, like, money in, like, all the right places. And he looks like a good guy. And he's, like, he has, like, his name, too. Like, despite Malfoy, like, Harry obviously gets the vibe that we get, we get the vibe, generally, that Malfoy is a very, like, prejudiced person. Like, he talks about like, the disgrace of Arthur Weasley and, like, his muggle law that he hates. Yeah. And so, yeah, we definitely get the vibe that Malfoy's not a good guy, but um, the secret this manor holds. So um, Harry's able to get out, but he realizes that he has no idea where he is. And this is honestly my worst nightmare, because since technology, like where I have access to Google Maps on my phone, like I generally know wh where I am at all times. But the idea of not knowing where I am like at all, it's terrifying. So yeah, I just like wizarding, wizards not knowing where they are. Like there must be a spell for that or something because that's scary stuff. But thankfully we have our favorite half giant, Hagrid, who rescues him. Yes. Hagrid to the rescue. So I was wondering why Hagrid says that he was down there to get flesh eating slug repellent. But like, what was he really doing down there? Do we believe him? 
I think so, because I think the backstory is like they're trying to grow the mandrakes and the flesh-eating slugs make it hard to grow your mandrakes and then the mandrakes come back later. Well, he's saying, he's saying the school cabbages are being eaten. Oh, it's cabbages. Why would the school grow? I mean, yeah. I mean, flesh-eating slug repellent could be a real thing. It makes sense that if there are flesh-eating slugs, you would need repellent. Seems weird that if they're prominent enough to be in the gardens, that it would only be sold on, like, Shady Street. Yeah, I just, like... Is that the only place you can buy it? Black market or something? Or maybe like, maybe there's like, you know how like certain chemicals are illegal to de-weed your garden now because they're too bad for the environment? Maybe he needs to use like illegally good flesh-eating slug repellent because of how... It just feels like Hagrid was like looking for a pub or something. Looking for a pub. <laughs> it didn't want to admit to Hagrid that he was drinking. Oh, that Maybe. <laughs> I'm joking. Maybe. I like my flesh-eating slug <laughs> deep dive though. I think it's... He looks for, like, extra strong <laughs> flesh-eating slug repellent. Well, Hagrid manages to get Harry back to the Weasleys. Thank goodness. And we get to see Fred and George, who are gosh darn delights. And they're... Yeah, so Fred and George are very jealous that Harry got to be Nocturne Alley. Because apparently it's, like, the place to be. Yeah, apparently they've all... I mean, it makes sense. It's sort of dark, shady, and obviously forbidden by their mother. So naturally it's a place they would want to visit. But I just love that that's immediately the way the twins are. As soon as it's dark, forbidden, and they shouldn't go there, they're like, absolutely, have always wanted to go. I love that about them. Like, they're just so much fun for the sake of fun. Yeah, they're very curious like they like to know how things go chaotic good you know yeah i also find it interesting that like harry sat there in morgan and burks and literally heard lucius say please come get it tomorrow because i think the ministry is coming to take a look at my house and he doesn't think to mention that to arthur like hey lucius is selling no he does he does mention it to ron mr weasley overhears but um yeah he mentions vaguely like you know Malfoy's up to some stuff and he's worried about the ministry and Arthur's Malfoy was there and he's and he he was like oh is he buying and Harry's like no he's selling and Malfoy, uh, Mr. Reese I don't think he like because I don't think they had planned it but he's like oh good he's scared yeah yeah he's excited that Lucius is nervous enough to get rid of stuff but now if Harry had said hey by the way Morgan's picking it up tomorrow the Ministry could raid Lucius's house tonight. Like, he could use that inside information to raid Malfoy Manor, knowing that Malfoy's getting stuff ready to get rid of, and maybe it's even more in the open if it's in progress to being taken away. Like, that's such a good opportunity and timing to have done a raid. Kind of seems like a missed opportunity for Harry to have shared that additional information. Yeah, I don't know how much control Mr. Weasley has over the raids. Like, I'm sure that he, they're kind of just, like, looking for stuff, but I don't know how much control he has over, like, where they go and when. I know, but it seems like if a dumb missed opportunity, like send someone, there's got to be a couple good guy Oros who would go and take a random check at Lucius's. I'm sure there's lots of people that hate Lucius Malfoy, the Ministry of Magic. What's Kins Kingsley doing at this point? Send Kingsley. Mrs. Weasley warns him. She's like, don't go after this guy. And it kind of like highlights at the end of the chapter what happens because Mr. We, we kind of get the idea that Mr. Weasley and Lucius do not get on and that is very true. Yeah. So you have relived your crush on Fred. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm always a Snape girl and I'll always love Snape the most, but Fred's so much fun. It's so easy to like, I don't know. Yeah, I also have a crush on, on Fred, apparently. It's it's fine. I did. I, I don't know. <laughs> He's a likable guy. He's very funny. He's, I love the chaos. The fun, lighthearted chaos. I, I love good twin content. They're always like, the banter is always on point. Make the, I, I miss like, you don't get as much as like fun stuff in the later books. So it's nice that everything's kind of like fun and lighthearted in a way. Yeah, it's good to have that. And the twins definitely bring it. So for the first time and like only time really, we get our first glimpse of Hermione's parents where they're actually there. So Hermione's parents have brought her into Diagon Alley and... Mr. Weasley's super excited and he's going to take them to the pub so he can, I guess, like, I don't know, talk to them about muggle stuff. But Hermione's parents don't even, like, talk or anything. Like, this whole chapter, they're just there. And I just feel like it's, like, a missed opportunity because I feel like you get more about Hermione through her parents. And they're just kind of, like, side characters. Like, they're, like, almost inconvenient. I mean, I feel like in this context, they wouldn't be giving a lot of information about Hermione because the thing that they would be being asked about would be Mr. Weasley being like, oh, tell me about how plumbing works and stuff and so they'd be like caught off guard answering those questions I don't think we'd get into like oh we're so proud of Hermione she's always done so well in school and it's nice that she's still doing well we can't even help her with the homework anymore ha 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 but like there's not much I think that would make sense for us to 
get from them here. No, I just like, I just find it so strange that Hermione's parents are just kind of like an afterthought because they're just like inconvenient to the plot. And I just feel like it's just so strange because I think it'd be cool to get an insight from parents that are like our parents and how they kind of like deal with that. Because we only like Muggleborns we really like hear about are Hermione and Dean and we don't get anything about their families. Yeah, we don't. That's true. It would have been interesting, but I don't know if this would have been the right time or place to have gotten, like, deep childhood information about Hermione. Especially because, like, so much already happens in this chapter. We had so much, like, foreshadowing and, like, conflict and, like, humor. And there's already... Things are building up. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot <laughs> in one chapter. You want to have your um, take on strawberry and peanut butter ice cream? Yeah, Why? Ew. Like, I love peanut butter. I love strawberries. I love peanut butter ice cream. I love strawberry ice cream. But together? Like, I understand two scoops of one flavor, even. Like, I love, like, a dark chocolate raspberry or, like, a, a spoonful of cappuccino on top of a vanilla. Like, delicious. But peanut butter and strawberry is not a combination I support, and I'm real concerned about it. I wonder, is the a UK thing or, like, just, like, uh, I don't even know, a wizard thing? I don't know. Also, where are the weird wizard ice cream flavors? I want, like, night sky and starkest toadstool. There's probably an ice cream flavor that has, like, all the birdie bots beans Oh, God. It. Bad time bean. Everyone's favorite flavor of ice cream. What I find the most interesting is uh, they find Percy reading a book called Prefects Who Gain Power. And Ron says he wants to be Minister of Magic one day. And it's just kind of like, I think I find Percy interesting that I'm older. just Because I like, just wonder, like... Is he ambitious because that's just who he was? Or it was more out of necessity? Because we kind of get a lot of the twins and Ron being like, oh, it really sucks, like, like being poor. And we don't know how we're going to like afford like our, our books and school stuff. And like, so I wonder if Percy, does he want to be ambitious because that's just like what he's called to do? Or is it more like he wants to be ambitious because he wants to like have a better financial security than he did growing up. Mm -hmm. I certainly think his ambition is is a big part of who he is. Like underlying just like he wants to succeed. He wants to impress people. He definitely has that. But I also think specifically when it comes to like wanting a job at the ministry, a high up job, I think it kind of comes back to his father. Like Percy has firsthand his whole life, A, seen how hard people at the ministry work but he's also seen how poorly some people who work hard are treated like he's seen his father work long hours work hard really do his best and still not make enough money to feed his family and I think Percy probably doesn't talk to his dad about it but he probably at times sees that and realizes how unfair it is and rather than just being sad about it he goes out there and tries to change it he's like if I were minister of magic why do you think Percy holds some resentment for Mr. Weasley not advancing because we know Percy has high ambition because he wants to advance and like have that I guess like I don't know that feeling of like power comes associated with it but we know that Mr. Weasley could have had a better job as Ron says but he likes like his department like that's just where he wants to be and we know later on when Percy ends up leaving the family and becoming estranged, part of the reason is that he's, like, really upset with, like, how his dad, like, had no ambition and basically let them be poor. And Percy kind of put, has a lot of resentment about that. So it just feels like Percy's just kind of, like, looking to have, to do just be better than his parents. And I feel like all, I feel like all the Weasley kids are definitely kind of money conscious because we know that Ron's very aware of it. And also the twins are also, despite not really being into school, they're also making, like, they had their own plans to, to make money and to kind of, like, not be like their parents as well. So I think it all kind of sticks with them, but in different ways. I think it's interesting to look into Mr. Weasley, and, like, I, it's respectable that he loved his job and wanted to stay at it, but, like, I'm not a parent, so I would never have to decide, like, do I give up a job I love so I can provide better for my family? And, like, it doesn't seem like the Weasleys are starving at home. But it seems like at times things are really, really tight. And at what point is Arthur Weasley actually being a bit negligent by not accepting promotions that are given to him if it could make his family's life a lot easier? Like, I don't want to say quit your job you love and do a shitty one just to feed your family more. But I feel like he should have considered it a little more maybe, especially like it's also hard for the Weasleys as a like a family of lower economic standing, they get made fun of a lot, you know? Like there's a lot of like broader implications on the family. And I feel like, I don't know, it's a tough choice 
but I hope he at least considered it. Yeah, because I think a lot of times people are telling you, like, oh, do what you love and you never work a day in your life. But the thing is also, like, we live in a capitalist society, like the Wizarding World, it's a capitalist society. So you have bills to pay. And if you have kids, you have kids you have to look after. And it's just kind of like, there's no shame in having a job that's just a job. But, like, it feels like Mr. Weasley obviously wanted to work in a job that he liked. It kind of feels like if he wanted to work in a job that he knew wasn't very profitable, he should have stopped having kids after the first four, maybe. <laughs> But do wizards believe in birth control? We've talked about this. Who knows? There's no way there's not a magic spell that... There's no way. Or a potion to... Mrs. Weasley just really wanted that girl. She's like... It's an interesting thing to look at, though. Certainly, like, Percy's ambition coming from his father sort of a lack of ambition, but also how Percy could see it as negligence. Or how Percy views it as lack of ambition. Yeah. Let us know what you think, because, yeah, we could probably talk more about that, about that in, like, the next upcoming books. But I always just find Percy more interesting as an adult, because he's such, like, the least liked Weasley. He's obviously, he's not as interesting or as fun as, like, all the other Weasleys. But just seeing where his motivations come from now that I'm an adult, and I'm not just, like, he's boring because all he hears about is, like, his job and stuff. But, yeah, I mean, like, definitely when he turns his back on his family, that's just shitty. They're lovely, and they care about him, and... But also his actual motivations to try hard in school and not break the rules is a choice. And like, there's nothing wrong with deciding to follow the rules, especially when it, like the path you want to take is in government jobs. Government people follow the rules or are really good at hiding that they can't. Like, it just, it makes sense. I, I feel sometimes now I can also look at Percy and have some sympathy for like how hard he works and how dedicated he is to like reaching his end goals and achieving what he wants in life. The Slytherin-ness. Yeah, absolutely. So moving to Lockhart, we, uh, who is doing a signing in the bookshop. But I just feel like Lockhart is the OG influencer, just like the whole way he comes across. Yeah, he is his own Instagram filter. You can just imagine he like has a magical dust around him that like blurs out his blemishes. And, and he's like, hey, buy my book. Yeah, he's a character, all right. He is a character. So you kind of get the idea that he's just like, all the boys think he's a bit of an idiot. And obviously Mrs. Weasley is very taken with him. So he's just like one of those like, um, so like mini celebrities, like on the Food Network or something that moms all really like are drawn to because they're good looking. And Hermione's obviously very drawn to, but she kind of plays it off that she doesn't have a crush, but we all know she does. Yeah. I mean, everyone I think, well, I don't know for sure, but most people I think at some point in their high school career had a crush on a teacher. Maybe even two. I, I can, I understand it. I don't see it because I am not interested in Kiljoy Lockhart at all, but maybe he has like a magic perfume potion we don't know about that he sprays on himself, like pheromones that like make girls kind of like him. Because his personality is not. Well, it's kind of like, it's like he's supposed to be very good looking and charismatic. But like, obviously we see it through Harry's perspective and Harry's like not into it. Harry sees right through it. Yeah. But I think we've all been in places where you're kind of blinded by like, just like someone's attractiveness or just how they hold themselves that you don't really kind of, especially Hermione being so young. Like she doesn't see, like it, like you would expect her to see through it, but because she's just having like her first crush, she doesn't, she kind of tries to block it out and she doesn't see it to like, Later on. Yeah, I guess. He's just such a grime. I don't know. He's just like, I'm not about that life. I'm, I don't get it. I'm not into the Gilderoy Lockhart. Uh. So Harry in, so Gilderoy finds Harry and he's just like, this is the PR dream and embarrasses Harry. No shame. None whatsoever. So Harry gets a free book set, which I don't even know how much the books would be worth. Because it's like, what, five or six books? A lot. He gives them to Ginny, which is nice. But then, of course, Malfoy comes up to ruin everything. God, he's such a little shit. I do love that Ginny, after weeks of being dead silent in front of Harry, like, being the badass she is, just can't stand for letting Draco be a dick to Harry, and she just immediately tells him off and is such a legend. It's definitely very Weasley of her. Like, they're always sticking up for, like, what they believe is right and stuff, so she's able to, like, kind of, like, let, like... Her, like, defensive nature come out. Yeah. Her crush on Harry is very strong, but her desire to punch, you know, Malfoy verbally is stronger. Malf so Lucius comes up and we kind of get, like, the whole Lucius meeting Harry. And he's being, like, he's seeming like he's being polite because it's in a social space. But we obviously get the idea that, like, Lucius is, like, over Harry Potter. <laughs> he does not care who he is. And he kind of lets him know that. He's smarmy. But also, this is like obviously at this point where um, Lucius 
lives to insult Mr. Weasley. And I just feel like he gives Ginny the diary, obviously, at some point in this um, commotion. And I feel like this was kind of politically motivated. Yeah, very subtly, too, I find. It's very well done. Because he doesn't, like, we kind of see at the end where Dumbledore kind of spells it out, but he gives Ginny the diary to open the chamber's secrets, which she does. And if she gets caught, it's Arthur Weasley's kid that's, like, hunting Muggleborns, and that's not a good look. And so I feel like he didn't know it was Voldemort's soul, but like basically he risked it all for political motivations, which is just such a Malfoy thing to do. I mean, I think part of it is like he knows now, like he's getting rid of things because his house is going to be raided. He knows this is dangerous and can cause havoc. He likes that. Um, and so it's kind of like I have to get rid of some stuff. I'm not going to sell it all to Borg and Bark. What if I just unleash some? And who is a convenient person to unleash terrible things upon that Arthur Weasley, who is the reason I have to get rid of some of my cool evil stuff. It checks out. But also it's interesting, just like Lucius Malfoy is such a, he's so good at being smarmy. Like he comes in at first almost polite and like, you know, he's just taunting Arthur. Like he wants Arthur to get angry. He wants that. And he's such a, he's so good at it because I want to punch Lucius Malfoy. So obviously this leads to the Mr. Weasley and Mr. Malfoy fight, which, iconic. I wish it was in the films, because I think it'd be so funny to see Jason Isaac and Mark Williams just, like, having a tussle. Yeah. I love that Lucius gets hit in the face with an encyclopedia of toadstools. What a book choice. I also find, uh, regarding the handing off of the diary, Lucius does a really good job of being very, very subtle when he does it. It's like this magical sleight of hand. We're so distracted by the fight that we don't really pay attention to the book. It's very well done. I also, looking back on it, think maybe Malfoy could have charged Arthur Weasley with assault and like, it's kind of a, he totally goaded Arthur Weasley into it, but like, the, Malfoy seemed like the type who love a frivolous lawsuit, so it's kind of surprising that that didn't end up in court. Probably would have done something, but Hagrid's the one that pulled them apart, and like sizing Hagrid up, you're kind of like, he's kind of just like, whatever. And I also don't think he likes making like a scene in a public place, because obviously Mal, like Gildred Lockhart's there, and he's trying to get the, the fight into the report for publicity. And Malfoy doesn't want like anything that like, will look bad on him, because even though it will like he could say, like, oh, I was attacked. It's still like he was in a fight in a public place. So, not a good look. Yeah, I guess if he filed charges, it would become more public. It's not proper for someone of his standing. An outstanding gentleman. <laughs> One thing I feel bad for is, like, Hermione's parents have probably, this is the first time they're reading, like, the Weasleys, and, like, the, the, like, the first time they meet him, and, like, he gets into this fight with some guy. Because apparently they're, like, shaking or something. Like, I'm just wondering... Yeah, they were very, very nervous. I'm just wondering what, like, their experience with the Weasleys and the magic in general was like. I feel like they certainly had a talk with Hermione on the car ride home. Like, are those really the people you hang out with? Are all wizards like that? Like, it seems so dangerous. But also, it's interesting because they're still always so prepared to send Hermione off to spend time with the Weasley family. Which is interesting because this is their interaction with the Weasley family. Like, maybe... It's not canon or in the book, but they all get together for lunch one day and like have a normal civilized conversation and they realize, okay, the Weasleys aren't crazy. They're just quirky. I feel like Mrs. Weasley is the person that would probably like write them a note being like, I am so sorry because like Mrs. Weasley was very embarrassed by it and she was so upset and she's yelling at her husband being like, like, how could you do that in front of your kids? So I feel like Mrs. Weasley is the person would be like, I am so sorry. Like, yeah, Molly cleaned up after. Because <laughs> I'm assuming she wants to make a good impression because like Hermione's a good friend and she's almost basically part of the family. So she doesn't want like her parents to be like, I don't want my daughter hanging with your, your family because your family's crazy. <laughs> I would really love to think that every once in a while in the summer, the Weasleys and the Gragers get together just because Arthur would be so happy to ask them about how their front door lock works or how... The car works or, you know what I mean? Like, I think that would be such a, like, once per year they have dinner at each of their houses. So both of them can get their, like, toe into the door to that other world. I think that would be really fun. Arthur's dream. Every time the Grangers are driving home from the Weasleys, they're like, I'm so happy we only had one child. <laughs> one thing I had thought about is, so we know that Malfoy gave Jenny the diary and he he knows that it would open the Chamber of Secrets, but he doesn't know it's Horcrux, is what we infer. But, um... 
I wonder what his Voldemort's intent was plan was because he knew he wanted to bring the chamber secrets, but I don't think he intended it to be given to Jenny. So I was like, was it supposed to be given to someone that wanted the chamber open, like to Draco or someone? Because like he wanted someone to open it, but he ended up possessing Jenny. Oh yeah, because Voldemort left the the diary. It's an interesting thought. I mean, it probably could have been slipped into to anyone. I feel like Voldemort probably didn't particularly make it for anyone specific. Um, just because I feel like the diary... It just feels... It feels like Malfoy just used Ginny because it was, like, political motivations. And obviously it could have done to anyone. But I just, like, feel like it was a mistake giving it to someone that was, like, unaware or, like, w- would resist it because that just exposes them to get caught. Um, it's... I suppose so. But I also think it's a su- super risky thing to do like a kid who knows what they're doing with that is almost more dangerous than a kid that doesn't because 12 year olds are going to be like I'm so cool hey guess what crab and goyle I'm opening the chamber of secrets like there's no way you know what I mean like I couldn't see a 12 year old who's doing that and thinks it's awesome not telling all of his friends and being an absolute jerk about it so I feel like it makes sense to give it to someone who if they accidentally did it and became conscious at any point, would be so ashamed of what they did. But also it's hurting the Weasleys, which you mentioned earlier, right? Like if Ginny gets caught, Ginny opened the chamber of secrets and got a bunch of people hypothetically killed. Wow, that makes Arthur look like an idiot and a bad dude. Especially because his whole law is to protect muggles and Ginny's around attacking muggle-borns. Like it's not a good look. And Malfoy knows that. Exactly. And also probably a little bit of like blatant sexism. Like I'm sure he thinks that like, a girl wouldn't have the strength to fight against the power of Lord Voldemort's diary. You know, like that's probably a part of it. Also, she's close to Harry Potter and she's close to Hermione and Malfoy's probably pretty sick of Hermione, you know, because now Draco's second in all his classes. So he's like, "Mm, you know, this seems like the right person in that they're young enough. He thinks they're weak enough. They're naive enough. They come from a family he hates and they happen to be closer to his particular enemies than just some random Hogwarts kid. I'm wondering, because we know Lucius is planning this, so was he planning to use Jenny the whole time or just giving it to a Weasley? Or was he just planning to release it at some point? Because Dolly does warn Harry that something's happening, there's a plan. So Lucius is obviously plotting something. I think he definitely planned this year to give it to a Hogwarts student. I think that he, the fact that he chose Ginny was probably like more a matter of, of circumstance. It was like... He was there, he saw the Weasleys, he's like, oh, that's an interesting option of who to give the book to. If I can goad him into fighting me, it'll be really easy to pass it to one of his children. So, like, I think it was, like, a planned to give someone the diary, sort of of spur-of-the-moment choice to choose a Weasley, and Ginny seemed like the weakest option to him. Boy, was he wrong. Ginny's a little badass, but... It's also convenient, too, because he, we do know that he's a governor of the Hogwarts board, so I'm assuming he was also going to use this to kind of oust Dumbledore. He had all these political plans and he didn't realize how important this diary was to Voldemort. All these dreams. Yeah, he uh, oopsie daisy He sure did oopsie daisy. Basically used Voldemort's soul as like a bargaining chip to get ahead in his like political endeavors. Yeah. And it backfired. <laughs> Don't you hate when that happens? A classic Malfoy. Uh, so thanks for listening to our podcast. Don't forget to press the buttons and, and do the things. And yeah. uh, follow us on social media at Potter Revisited. And you can email us about any questions or your thoughts about any of our episodes at Potter Revisited Podcast at gmail.com. And we'll be back next time to discuss chapter five of Chamber of Secrets, The Whomping Willow. Bye. Bye.